Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. You guys have been asking me to cover this prolific serial killer and today we're discussing Gary Ridgway, otherwise known as the Green River Killer. This is going to be a three-part video series. You know I don't do these multi-part videos very often, but if you like these deep dives, please give the video a like and comment down below if you want more of these. But with that being said, let's get into it. It was in Washington State in the summer of 1982 when five women's bodies would be found in the Green River. This would start the hunt for one of America's most prolific serial killers. On July 15, 1982, two boys were biking along the Green River in Kent, King County, Washington. While crossing a bridge, they noticed something in the water below them. When the boys went to take a closer look, they found a naked woman's body stuck to one of the bridge's pilings. The body was found wearing socks and shoes, with the other clothes tied around the neck like a ligature. An autopsy would show the cause of death to be strangulation, and she'd also suffered a broken arm. The police eventually identified the body as 16-year-old Wendy Lee Caulfield. In July 1982, Wendy was living with a foster family in Tacoma, Washington. On July 8th, she left her home and was not seen again. The police believe that Wendy was killed shortly after July 8th. Only two days after Wendy's body is removed from the water, the Green River Killer strikes again. Within a month, five more bodies dumped in the Green River. To elude police, the killer gradually expands his dump sites to a 50-mile radius of the Strip. Like at Star Lake Road, a remote wooded grove where six skeletons are found. For a year and a half, a young woman disappears or a body is discovered at the rate of almost one per week. Then, for inexplicable reasons, the killing in Seattle ends. The Green River Killer goes on the move. 22 women dead, four officially attributed to the killer. New killing fields. More than 38 bodies have been recovered. The most recent, just last week. The victims, street people. Most killed like those in Seattle. Some believe it might be the work of the Green River Killer. Wendy was known to frequent the Pacific Highway South, or PHS, as a sex worker. The PHS was known as The Strip in Seattle, and it was an area known for its strip clubs, adult stores, bars, as well as a place to go to find sex workers and drugs. Almost a month later, on August 12th, another body was found in the Green River. This body was found downstream. The body had been caught on some built-up logs. The body was completely naked, with no clothing or other evidence found. Law enforcement would eventually identify her as 23-year-old Deborah Lynn Bonner, a known sex worker who also worked the strip, and she'd been known to law enforcement, having been arrested twice in the 30 days prior to her disappearance. She was last seen on July 25th, leaving a hotel in Kings County. Three more bodies would be found in the same area of the Green River. On August 15th, only a few days after Deborah was found, a man was rafting down the river when he saw two bodies at the bottom. They were naked and covered in large rocks. They were located 600 yards from where Deborah's body had been discovered. Police arrived and removed the two women from the water. And while searching the surrounding area for evidence, they found another body on the bank of the river. The two bodies found in the water were identified as 31-year-old Marcia Chapman and 17-year-old Cynthia Hines. 16-year-old Opal Mills was identified as the body found on the bank of the river. All of their causes of death was strangulation. Semen samples were found on Marcia and Opal's bodies, but DNA was not what it is today in 1982, but the samples were preserved. sterile language of cops, this is a dump site. You are about to go behind police lines. You are Detective Dave Reichert. You've been with the investigation since the very first victim. I've located the mandible. There are also some teeth missing from that. 
Forty times before, you've followed the same path as the killer. Immediately visible at this time. This is the closest you've ever come to meeting him. The remains are kind of scattered. Somewhere there may be a clue, slender as a sliver of the killer's fingernail buried in over an acre of brush. That looks like a band-aid or a piece of, uh, piece of gauze. That's why you clear the site with scissors. Shovel with tweezers. Hey, Dave. A robin's nest, dismantled strand by strand, in case a bird has woven in a thread of the killer's coat. 108. The work resembles, but is even more precise than an archaeological dig. I don't know, race is going to be a problem until we get back in the On the human body, there are few parts that don't decompose in the first year. The hair mass, nails, and the bones. But rarely do they disclose identity. The surest ID tags are the teeth, which hold the secrets of age, and, through dental records, the exact identity of the victim. I think that the, the other features of the skeleton certainly put it in, the, in that mid-second uh, decade of life. Yet even that may not be enough. In Seattle, there are three boxes which enclose remains that cannot be buried. They are the unidentified. But they are not forgotten. Marcia Chapman was working as a sex worker to take care of her three children. On August 1st, 1982, she left her apartment that she shared with her children and was never seen again. On August 11th, 10 days later, Cynthia Hines was working on the PHS when her pimp recalled that she was getting into a jeep with a John, and she was not seen after that. One day later, Opal Mills called her parents around 1 p.m. from a phone in Angle Lake State Park near the PHS. That was the last anyone had heard from her. Her family had been adamant that Opal hadn't been involved in any illicit business on the PHS, but friends would tell police that they knew Opal would partake in sex work occasionally. Months following the discovery of the bodies, a task force would be made in hopes of finding what they now believed to be a serial killer. But that would not be the end. Over the next few years, a task force would be called in to the site of more and more victims. By 1984, they believed they had more than 19 connected victims. All of the women were found in secluded areas around the Seattle-Tacoma area, and all had been strangled. The community was outraged by the increasing amount of dead women, as well as missing persons cases. Sex workers stopped working the strip, and those that remained would create safety measures, working in groups, taking down license plates, and carrying protective equipment. There were even protests and demonstrations from people who believed that law enforcement were not doing everything they could because the majority of the murdered women were sex workers. Over 21 women have disappeared from this street and turned up later murdered and dumped on the outskirts of the city. The killer or killers is still at large. Live from Times Square, New York City, Detective Joe Surlack. Our suspect has killed several women here in the New York area and moved on. We tracked him across the country by carrying dead bodies. He loves them, then leaves them dead. From Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Detective Mike Smith of the Metropolitan Police Department. In Nashville, we're part of a multi-state investigation in the red-headed murder cases. At least eight women have been dumped off of main roads and interstate highways in Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky. From Utah, Detective Jim Bell. Here in Salt Lake City in the northern Utah area, we've got 14 murdered or missing women. From Washington State, Sheriff James Montgomery. There may be 300 serial killers across the country. Here in Seattle, King County, we've got the biggest case in America. He's killed at least 48 teenage girls that we know of. And most were taken from the SeaTac Strip, Pacific Highway South, not too far from the airport. It's a highly transient area, south of Seattle, near the Green River. That's where they found the first body.
The killer has eluded police for six years, but he's still out there, somewhere in America, stalking a highway in search of his next victim. Now it's time for you to stop him and help bring him to justice on Manhunt Live. A police dog tracking the remains of a victim found across the road picks up a new scent and another body. But this one is different from all the others. It's the first one that's been buried. But why? To find out, police sift every grain of soil. But it's the remains themselves that give the real answer. The killer made a mistake. He murdered someone he didn't count on. A mother eight months pregnant. With me now is Dave Reichert, lead detective of the Green River Task Force. Dave, the clip was just over about the girl eight months pregnant. What other mistakes or information do you have about the killer? Well, one of the most important facts that we know is that our killer was driving a pickup truck in 1983. And we have five cases where uh, we have witnesses who have identified one of our victims being in or near a pickup truck. In three of those cases, the pickup truck was described as a Ford pickup truck late 60s, early 70s model. Uh, the other two were they were a GMC product. Now some of these uh, witnesses also, also described the uh, bumper of the truck as being white in color. That's the rear bumper. Uh, the canopy was a light color and was about cab high uh, or just a little bit higher, maybe two or three inches higher. Uh, the passenger side of the truck had primer spots on it like uh, the, the killer had done some body work to it. So that's important then that the, the killer may have repainted his truck a number of times. Yes, that's true. The FBI would lend a hand, giving this profile to their suspect and aspects that they believed would match their killer. Caucasian male in his late 20s or early 30s, familiar or has an emotional tie to the Green River, has a higher than average intelligence, drives conservative older vehicles, low self-esteem, divorced. They also noted that he was an impulse killer. They speculated that he didn't leave the house going to kill. The timeline was random, sporadic, and increasing in frequency. They said that their suspect would be someone who frequented the PHS, but flies under the radar. A majority of his encounters with sex workers would be non-violent, which would build up trust. In their profile, they also said that growing up, he may have been raised in a broken home by his mother as a prominent parental figure. The guy is a white male, about 40, uh, single, probably uh, uh, ex-military person, right around 40, late 30s, early 40s. I think he's probably in the construction trades. He can get up and uh, move to another area and get a job easily. They said that he wouldn't have issues approaching or talking to women, but that the killer felt lied to or fooled by women one too many times. They also felt that he targeted sex workers because he wasn't charming enough to pick up women at bars. They also suggested that he didn't approve of women doing sex work despite being a customer. He didn't view sex workers as people. The profile concluded that, quote, Possibly the subject is killing because the victims are not listening to his preaching regarding their activities, or making fun of him or laughing at him. He is an angry individual who demonstrates power over his victims and enjoys the publicity he is receiving. They released this to the public, and then they opened tip lines asking for information if anyone knew of anyone who may be the killer, may fit the profile, or have any sort of relation to the victim. On the tip line, they got a call from a man named Melvin Foster, who gave a tip that a man named Dan Smith might be involved. They brought in Dan Smith and quickly eliminated him as a suspect. The detectives on the task force would remember that the FBI told them that the suspect might call and insert himself into the investigation and may even point fingers at someone else. This made them look into Melvin Foster. Melvin Foster was a taxi driver who worked the strip. They brought him in for questioning. He eventually admitted to having some of the victims in his taxi at one point or another. He was asked to do a polygraph, 
which he agreed, but when asked questions about the victims and if he knew anything about the Green River killings, he failed the polygraph. The Green River Task Force would put Foster under 24-hour surveillance for months, but they never got anything from the surveillance, which was eventually stopped. Been called the Green River Killer ever since the first bodies, five of them, were pulled from this river. Since then, seven more bodies have been discovered nearby, all those of young prostitutes, according to police. And the number of missing increases steadily. Two were added to the list this week. All the victims worked this strip near the Seattle airport, crammed with hotels, motels, and strip joints. Angry residents are demanding police do more to stop the killings. One young prostitute who operates along the strip said she's terrified every time she's picked up. I don't know, I'm just, I guess I'm just lucky that I never came across that certain freak. <laughs> Police say the victims are similar, runaways, very young, disturbed. Most were strangled, their bodies left nude. A police task force has little hard evidence, but it thinks a single psychopathic killer is responsible. However, it would be illogical and improper from an investigative perspective to become that tunnel vision and exclude the possibility of any copycat crimes or the possibility of a multiple suspect. Police suspect other prostitutes might be able to provide leads, but because of their profession, they've been uncooperative. In December 1984, a woman came forward after seeing a news report with the detectives from the task force asking for help. Rebecca Jardigue would explain that she'd been assaulted by a man that she believed might have been the Green River Killer. In November of 1982, she was hitchhiking on the PHS when a man pulled up in his truck and offered her a ride. She asked if he was looking for a date and offered him oral sex for 20 bucks. He accepted and she told him where to stop. She would ask if he was the Green River Killer jokingly, and to prove he wasn't, he would show her IDs from his wallet which included a work ID for Kenwood Trucking Company. He asked if she would go into the woods to perform the sex act. She accepted, and they walked into the woods together. When the man stopped, he pulled down his shorts and she began. When he didn't seem to get erect, he pushed her down, accusing her of biting him. He got Rebecca in a chokehold. She managed to escape and flee to a nearby trailer. The man pulled up his shorts and attempted to chase her, Realizing he couldn't catch up, fled back to his truck and drove off. She was reluctant to come forward because she was a sex worker at the time of the attack. The task force would look at files of men known to use sex workers. They found one who worked at Kenworth Trucking Company. They put his picture in a six-photo lineup. Right away, Rebecca picked out the man. And they had the name Gary Ridgway. In early 1985, a task force member went and talked to Ridgway, asking about the incident with Rebecca, and he admitted it, saying that he only choked her because she had bit him. No charges were ever filed at that time against Ridgway. They never stopped looking into him after this, though, but this was not the first time he'd been on law enforcement radar. Back in 1983, Ridgway was interviewed by law enforcement about a missing teen. On April 30th, 1983, 18-year-old Marie Malvar was working the PHS strip. Shortly after having a meal with her boyfriend, he saw her get into a dark-colored truck near the bus stop at South 216th and the PHS, with only one man in the vehicle. After she got in the truck, her boyfriend got in his car and followed them. The truck first went north, then turned around in a motel parking lot and headed south. After a few turns, the boyfriend lost the vehicle. Marie was never heard from again. On May 3rd, the boyfriend reported her missing to the Des Moines Police Department. He had lied the first time he spoke to them, saying that he'd last seen her at their home and that she'd left to use a payphone at the PHS. On May 4th, he would admit to knowing that Marie was a sex worker and had likely picked up a John. He described the man as a Hispanic male in his 40s driving a dark pickup truck. Also on May 4th, the boyfriend searched the neighborhood for the truck hoping to find it. He went back to the Des Moines Police Department and reported that he believed he'd found the truck parked outside 21859 32nd Place South. Police detectives went to the residence and saw a maroon truck outside. They talked to the residents. They found Gary Ridgway and they interviewed him. He admitted to being arrested in the past for picking up sex workers, but that he knew nothing of Marie. 
He also told detectives that he'd been unemployed for the past year, and he'd actually been on strike with his work at Kenworth. He was not considered a suspect after this interview. Marie's driver's license would be found at the SeaTac airport several weeks later. Many tips would come in about sightings of Marie, that she was in Hawaii or Hollywood. One tipster would even say they were with her brother when he got a call from Marie. In February 1985, her family expressed their belief that she was still alive, hearing that she'd been seen in Hollywood, Tacoma, and Long Beach. None of these tips would be confirmed, and Marie's body would not be found until 2003. By 1985, the killings all but seemed to have stopped, which was very odd as most serial killers usually continue killing until they're caught or dead, leaving detectives to believe that Green River Killer might have moved or had started dumping bodies elsewhere. The task force kept looking into every possibility. Well, this is where we're going to end part one. Come back tomorrow for part two. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end. As always, if you want to support the channel, the easiest way is to hit the like button. You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. Other ways to support the channel are by joining my Patreon or channel membership. I also have merch and you will find all the links in the description box plus a few extras. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter for more. But with that being said, thank you so much for being here and supporting what I do. It is very appreciated. But that's it for me. I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.